We've been experiencing, always have been, but recently we've been really praying more for miracles. Uh, and there are many. There's, there's financial things. There's healings of emotions, that kind of thing. But I, I want to share with you three physical healings that have taken place just in the last few weeks in our church because we're praying. Pastor Toby, who was just up. Anybody love Pastor Toby and Chris? Aren't they awesome? Aren't they just the best? Oh my gosh, I love this couple. I'm gonna move in with them. <laughs> recently, <clears throat> recently, uh, Pastor Toby um, was having a little fish, physical question with, between him and his doctor and they decided to do an ultrasound and they found a large mass on his liver. And so he told a few of us about that, we started praying. We just went to prayer. In fact, I remember him saying something about that on one of our Thursday night prayers. We're gonna pray, here's what's happened. Don't know yet, now uh, we've seen the mass on the ultrasound, they wanna do a CT scan, so it was scheduled for a few days later. So the CT scan happened, and we're waiting on the edges of our prayer altar to hear the miracle from God, because between the ultrasound and the CT scan, where's God? So it says, um, he told some of us to pray, we did. The doctors then wanted to do the CT scan. So after that, he finally uh, was able to talk to the doctor about the CT scan, and she was really quite confused. She said they, 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 they couldn't find anything on his liver from the CT scan. So what, what the technicians, what they saw early, was real, so the doctor's kind of confused. Uh, you know, it, it showed up so clearly in the ultrasound, how has it disappeared? And Toby said, well, you know, I, to, I told her we did a lot of praying. And she said, well, your prayers worked. <laughs> healed. Come on, somebody, healed. I love this one, uh, Nick and Jenny. Anybody here love Nick and Jenny Snyder? Are they amazing? And they, they just had a little baby girl, Lily. And about a month after their daughter was born, they discovered a growth, something unusual, on the upper thigh on one of her legs. So they took it to the doctor, uh, but the doctor couldn't really, upon evaluation, didn't really know what it was. And he said that the location of it was concerning to him, and he was also an educated medical guess was that this would be something that could be on her for many, many years, this particular growth, this thing on her leg. So he recommended they get some blood tests and they, to make sure it wasn't something serious. So the, they took her to get the blood, her, uh, the blood test, but the samples weren't usable, and so we're supposed to go back and do it again later. In the meantime, we're all praying. In the meantime. We find the growth and then we pray. So Nick, Nick just gave me this update. He said, we were praying for her and believing, got the friends and Thursday prayer, all these other prayer times. And about a week later, the growth just suddenly began to shrink. Wow. And over the course of three days, it, you, it's almost like you just watch it in three days <laughs> until now there's not a trace of that growth. It's gone. Oh, Isn't that great? And this one is a, 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 a lovely young lady named Anna who happens to be my daughter-in-law. If you've not met Anna, she's from Sweden. She's beautiful and godly. I just love her so much. Here's her story. She's dealt with chronic pain since the age of 14, coming into womanhood. And at times it was so severe, she literally could not get out of bed for days. She saw many, many doctors, nothing helped. They finally, in the last number of years, diagnosed it as stage four endometriosis, which has led to five massive surgeries over eight years with cysts that would be found. They would take them, they come back, take them, they come back. So recently she was experiencing that pain again. I mean, as in a couple weeks ago. Went in for the checkup during the ultrasound, which is just, just typical, uh, the technician saw right then multiple cysts again and told her that. So she felt fearful for the moment, thought she'd have to have her sixth surgery and that this is never gonna end. But she was prayed for by different people in the church, laying on of hands. I remember praying for her right up here, and anointing her with oil like the Bible teaches. And, and she came to Thursday night pursuit prayer, and ladies gathered around her. We went after it and battled in prayer. We were prayed for, and right before she uh, 
talk to the doctor about the ultrasound, one of the ladies told her, said, look, you're not going to get a bad report. You're going to get a good report. So she left here thinking, okay, God, I'm believing for a good report. I already got a bad report from the technician, but I'll be the doctor's going to give me. She was wrestling with this because we've been praying, good report, good report, and that God would heal her. So she went in the next few days and saw the doctor to go over the results of the ultrasound, and the first words of the doctor were, hey, I've got a good report for you. <laughs> There's no cyst. I don't know what you're talking about from the ultrasound. There's no cyst in you. Uh, you don't have to have surgery. Not only that, she said, you look so great. Just come back to me when you're pregnant. Yeah. And then she adds to this. Want you clear to understand this. I have never had a good report on an ultrasound in 15 years until this one. Come on. Let's thank God for his healing power. God's a healer. Turn to your neighbor and say, God the healer. We're going to be talking about prayer a lot, and um, I'm excited about it. It's not going to be, you have to pray, you need to pray, you should pray. It's going to be, we're going to come into the presence of God and pray, and everything's changing. It's a perspective shift about prayer. So don't miss Sundays. The next number of weeks, do not miss Sundays. Hear the message of the preaching and the teaching. Uh, and plus, prayer is not just taught, it's caught. You, you get in the presence of people who can pray, and you catch it like a cold, and it just gets on you, and suddenly you find yourself energized. You start copying how they pray, and suddenly the, the engines of prayer begin to grow. Anybody ever experienced that? You catch the spirit of prayer from other people. So don't miss Sundays. Secondly, don't miss pursuit prayer. We just started it for 2024. It's new to us. Thursday nights at 6 p.m. I know it's an interesting time of the week, but anybody here need God in a desperate way? You want to see things change in how you live, where you live, what you have, who you're with, what's going on, how you feel? Only God moments will take place when we take the time, spend the time to seek him. Pursuit prayers one hour from 6 to 7 p.m., and we're going after. We'll pray for sickness. We're going to pray for the city. We're going to pray for finances. We're going to pray for joy. We go after it big time, and we're fighting in faith. A third thing, so be here on Sundays. Come to Thursday prayer at 6, pursuit prayer. Thirdly, I felt God prompt me to start something called prayer warriors. Any prayer warriors in the house today? What a prayer warrior. I, I, I was listening. I like to listen to messages. I was listening to a guy named Chris Hodges. He's a pastor on the East Coast as a church of about 30,000, 40,000 people. I just heard him speak live a couple of weeks ago. He's just a very humble man, but greatly successful. And he was telling, as I'm listening online, he was telling his story of his journey becoming a Christian as a teenager in a church that was absolutely in it on the prayer thing. Man, it was a prayer machine, a house of prayer. So he just... That's all he knew. That was the only church. So he just got swept into a spirit of prayer as a young man. And it grew and grew and grew. And later, a few years goes by, and he gets called by God to be a pastor. And he finds himself being asked to be a youth pastor of a new church somewhere in, I think it's in, in Denver. And that youth group, within a couple of years, became the largest youth group west of the Mississippi. And everybody goes, yeah, yeah all right. That's what he said. Well, let me tell you how that happened. He said, I knew that I didn't have enough smarts and that I wasn't cool enough to young people. He's a kind of nerdish guy, he really is. He really, really is. I knew I wasn't cool enough. I knew that I, I didn't have all it needed, and I knew that I'm not smart enough. I knew I needed God. So what I did, before the youth group was gonna meet on Wednesday, so I got a new group I started on Tuesday, and that's called, I called them prayer warriors. I gathered people who I knew and I trust who had a heart for God and a heart for prayer and a heart for young people. And we met every Tuesday and we went to battle. We went to warfare and we cried out to God to pour out his spirit and bring a revival to the city and shake the generation, bring in the young people, he said, and it started happening. But here's the thing, what happened on Wednesday was caused by what happened on Tuesday. So I just felt compelled to start prayer warriors in our church. We meet on Thursday night at Pursuit Prayer. We take a little slice out of that, and we meet with prayer warriors, have a prayer time, pray for me, pray for the message, pray for Sunday, and just gear it up. If you'd like to be a prayer warrior, it's a pretty elite team. You'd be really privileged if you were. I think we have a QR code up here somewhere. Uh, you, can, you can scan the code or text prayer warrior, prayer warrior, PWPW. 
PWPW, saying it twice. And you can text 97,000 and we'll get back to you. I'd love to have you on that team. We need more prayer too, so we can see what God wants to do. Anybody in? Yeah. Today I want to talk to you specifically about prayer, about partnership. And when I say that, I mean partnership in this way. Our prayer plus God's power. Our prayer plus God's power. That's the partnership. And I want to prove it to you in the Bible. This is actually God's plan and strategy. And I, mean, I want to look at a scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It's just one verse. If you've been in church very long, you'll know this one. Let me read it to you. If my people, somebody say, that's me. That's me. If my people who are called by my name <clears throat> will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then, if then, if people do something, he's saying, I will do something. If then, if my people will pray, then, I will hear from heaven. You pray on earth, I'll hear it in heaven. Not only will I hear it, I'm going to do something about what you pray. Mm, this is so simple, so powerful. Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive your sin, and I will heal your land. God is saying, when my people, the ones that are called by my name, when they humble themselves and pray, Prayer is, someone says, prayer is the ultimate act of humility. It's saying, God, I can't figure this out. I can't do that. I tried. I, I, it's beyond me. I humble myself. I need you. God delights in humility. He doesn't want us to be weak. He wants us to be strong. But he does want us to be humble. Humility is not weakness. Is saying, I am strong in the Lord, but I know one thing, I cannot do this without him. I humble myself in my journey. I can't fix all these problems that I'm facing, all these anxieties I fight, but God can. I humble myself and I pray, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Do you see the partnership? If you pray... I will act. You pray on earth, and when you do, it connects to me in heaven. I got it. I send down the answer. In fact, it, the concept of partnership, you're going to see it in a lot of scriptures in the Bible. God responds to our response. We respond to his word. It teaches us. If you pray, if we respond to what the word teaches about prayer, the Bible teaches about prayer, then God responds by bringing miracles. The impossible becomes possible. I, I, I read this quote from John Wesley, the great preacher who uh, lived in the 1700s. Um, he said this, God does nothing for humanity apart from prayer. God doesn't push his way into your life. He doesn't push his way into Carmel and say, hey, man, I, I'm overflowing. I'm a good God. I'm going to do everything for you. He says, um, uh, in, in one sense, he's saying, uh, read the word. Pray. Yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm a good father. I'm ready to pour out blessing on Carmel Church and everybody in it. I'm just, I think I hear someone crying out. Oh, here, answer's coming. In fact, someone said it this way. Without him, we can't. Without us, he won't. Wow. Huh. So it, 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 it puts this unique spin on the concept of prayer, that it's a partnership with God. Think of it this way. When I face a problem in my life or one that's around me in my sphere of life and influence, I can partner with God to bring the answer. I'm going to share a couple stories in a minute. I mean, this partnership thing is powerful. In fact, it, it, I want to give you one more story in the, uh, in the Bible to illustrate this concept. Sometimes we face problems and sometimes we face things that are impossible. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. And so what, what is prayer? Prayer is saying this is impossible. I'm reaching, I'm reaching up into God's world. I'm partnered with God who's in heaven. I'm reaching into heaven through prayer where I can then receive the answer for the impossible thing, where I can receive the victory in the battle that I'm in. Some of you are in a battle today. 
In fact, probably everybody in the room is in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. It is a battle in your body, your marriage, your finances, but really it's a spiritual battle. It's manifest in different ways for all of us. Every battle really comes under one battle. It's a spiritual battle, and it's one in the spirit of prayer. So the story is Moses is leading the children of Israel. He got them out of Egypt. Now they're headed to the promised land. They were not too far along in the journey. It's in Exodus chapter 17 when suddenly an enemy nation, the Amalekites, came out and surprised them in an attack. Well, the people of Israel, for the last 400 years, all they knew was slavery. They weren't trained um, soldiers. So their military skill was limited. So Moses just did what he, hey, Joshua was his right hand. Hey, Joshua, uh, you're the guy closest to me. Go find some men, get some sticks, do something. Go fight these guys. That's literally all they knew. They had no sword, shield, nothing. No armor, no training. They were slaves headed to a promise God gave them. And an enemy... And the enemy is a picture of the devil trying to keep them from the promised land. He's trying to keep you from your promised land. So let's read the story. So it was, uh, back up. Moses said, Joshua, you go fight the bad guys. I'll go up on this hill and I'll seek God. So it says, uh, uh, so it was when, when Moses held up his hand on the hillside watching the battle. As Moses held up his hand that Israel, or I'm gonna, Carmel Church, Prevailed. Hands up. Prevail. Put your hands up. Shout out. Hands up. up. We prevail. prevail. Okay, you can put them down. When he laid his hands down, uh uh-oh, Amalek prevailed. Now, you got to get a picture that word might not painting for you. That means people died. People literally died in a battle. The... They were winning in prayer. They were losing when they stopped. That's the picture. That's the picture. It's the partnership. Moses doing his part, God doing what he promised. So let's finish it. Moses' hands became heavy. Couldn't, I mean, how much, how much can you do? How, many, how long can you hold your hands up? Try it sometime, it, you know. So his hands became heavy, so they took a stone, put it down for him to sit on it. And Aaron and her, two great men, two great leaders, supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other, and his hands then were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua, or Carmel Church, defeated Amalek and its people. There are some Amaleks in our lives. Sneak attack, coming to take away your joy, coming to take away your moral purity, coming to take away your money, coming to destroy your marriage, on your journey to the promised land. The promised land for us is the book. Everything God promises, this is what is ours. In the journey, in the conquest to have everything this book promises, Amalek will come against you. And the way to conquer that battle and any battle is not ha, but ha. Shaking in your boots, not knowing what you're going to do, not knowing how to fix it, you cry out to the God who can do anything. There's nothing too hard for him. And if some of you came in here today and you've been wrestling with Amalek all week, and God wants to show you, you're going to find a defeat of your enemy. You're going to be healed of the sickness. You're going, to be, you're going to find the open door because one just closed. The provision looks like it's over. God's going to give you a better one. And that is accomplished not because of your ingenuity or your persistence on your own. It comes through the persistence of being on your knees and saying, I humble myself to someone greater than me. Would you just, now we're not trying to hurt people. Our enemy is the devil, not people. But God, would you destroy my enemy? Somebody say, cast out the devil. Say it better. Say, cast out the devil. Yeah, he wants to get in your life. Get in my life. I woke up this morning, had that devil talking to me again at four o'clock. So you know what I did? I'm practicing what I, I, I prayed from four to six for the church. I said, I'll show you. And actually, the frustration and the pain that he brought, tried to bring to me dissipated, and it was a powerful prayer time. So we're becoming a house of prayer. We're becoming people who learn to partner with God. It's a learning process. I remember I was, uh, I was raised in church, didn't know much about prayer. I went to church every week. That was what you did. 
And um, I was a teenager in my teenage years, and I, I slipped away from my family roots and got involved with the influence of high school and drugs and alcohol and partying of my generation, the hippie generation, grow your hair long and smoke a cigarette and try to be cool kind of a thing. And I did that. And it lasted about a year and a half. And during that time, there was a young couple uh, that came to our church, Bobby and John. And they were older than me. They had a daughter almost my age. And they had a heart for God. I never, had never met anybody like them. They were so kind and gracious. And they, they had a heart for young people, so they started having the youth meeting. There were about four of us, small church. So I was kind of forced to go, and I didn't want to go. And I'm, I'm miserable. I'm partying on Saturday and going to youth meeting on Sunday, and it's just not, not a good thing. I'm, I'm, so after church, John and Bobby, for over a year, almost weekly, would meet at the front door, tears down her eyes and sometimes down his, and they reach out shaking, Jerry McKinney, God's got great plans for your life, son. Do you understand that we're praying for you? And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, get out of my way. I, God, this is scary. I mean, every week. You know what they were doing? I found out later. Every week during the week. God, you got to get Jerry McKinney. He's got, you've got a plan for him. You've shown us he's going to be a man of God, and he doesn't see it. So we're praying. You bring him out of that. They were praying all week, every, over a year. And I resisted it like the plague. Until one day, same church, same story, except this time it changed. Just in a church service, I sat in the back. I got somewhere in the back. It was a smaller church, and there was a lot of empty pews, so I found a place to hide. I got on my knees, started weeping like a baby. For the first time in my life at 17, I finally got it. God, I can't do this anymore. I am miserable. I am so miserable. This sin thing, this is not good. I don't want any part of it. I don't know if you could ever forgive me. I've done too many bad. I literally didn't know if he could. My theology was, I, I don't even know if you can forgive me. I'm too bad. I, please help me. Would you forgive me? <laughs> Before I finish the sentence, forgiving, cleanse, powerful. Then I, after that, man, I want to be at church seven days a week. I'm carrying my Bible to school. My life radically changed. Guess who was there the whole journey? Jerry. God's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for you. We've been praying for you all yesterday. I was praying while doing the dishes. I just, God's got a plan for you. Hands up. Defeat the Amalekites. That was the same couple that kept talking to me about the call of God, which seemed like a prison sentence to me. Are you kidding me? I can't. I, I can't. In the same church, God called me to. I wouldn't be standing here today if John and Bobby had not gotten their hands up to heaven and had a partnership agreement between their prayer and God's working and a young man they wanted to help. They actually moved their family to South Florida and attended the same Bible college I did. They said they did it for themselves, but they were there to kind of nurture me along. Talk about sacrifice, prayer. It's powerful. I, well, that's the beginning of me. I, I remember the first time I, I felt, my, I experienced my personal first miracle, if you will, small one, but big to me. I was a new Christian, maybe six months into it, and there was a big youth meeting we had planned one night at church, and I was excited to go to it. I probably was going to share a little bit of talk, and one of the guys was going to be speaking. It's going to be cool. I was jazzed about it, and I got really sick that day. I mean, I'm so sick. I mean, you know, a hot fever throwing up, just out of control, yuck stuff. And I'm laying in the bed. It's 4 o'clock. It's 5 o'clock. It's 6 o'clock, and it's going to start in an hour. And I'm laying there so miserable, and I remember saying, wait a minute. I heard those scriptures from the pastor the other day that if I ask in faith and pray, you'll heal me. By your stripes, I'm healed. So I'm just going to put my hands up and say, God, I'm on earth. I'm in pain. I know you're there. Would you heal me? Bam! Whoa! Completely free from every symptom, and went to church. That was my fir personal first moment of the upreach in my young Christian life. Didn't know much theology, didn't know much about who God was, but I did know a couple of scriptures, enough to tell me that if I prayed and reached up to him, he could reciprocate, so why the heck not try it? Yes. I remember it's growing in more and more times of prayer and learning how it works and and, and being burdened to pray, and, I, and a year later, I, I enroll in a university to study theology to become a pastor. 
while I've been in school, I, this whole prayer journey is getting stronger. I, every morning, and the Holy Spirit would just wake me up, and I'd pray for at least an hour before I went to classes, before I would eat, and most mornings wouldn't eat. Just this little thing, journey God had me on, okay? Yeah. Just a journey of prayer and getting answers. Oh, man, doors would open, leading people to Christ. Crazy, cool stuff as a young Christian. I'm studying to be a pastor, learning all this prayer thing. One day, I'm in my dorm room, and I'm praying, and I literally heard in my spirit, my sister who lived 500 miles away, I heard my sister's voice. I knew it was her. She said, Jerry! And I was startled. I, oh my gosh. Man, I just started crying out. Went into prayer. Prayed for about 30 minutes for my sister Judy. And, and it, was, it was an intense prayer time. I could feel like I was battling something. And I, this was a journey. I didn't know how to do this. I just did it. That, that needs to speak something to somebody here. You don't have to know how to do this perfectly. Just start doing it. Just start crying out. He hears the cry, and he answers. So I finally, I felt some peace come over me, and I went to the payphone. You, you remember those? That was all we had. If you want to call me, you got to call the payphone and hope somebody in the dorm would answer it, and then they got to find out and see if you're there. So I went to the payphone. I didn't have any money, so I had to have somebody pay for me. It's a, it's a crazy thing. Call, yeah, but hey, what do you say? You send the charges? Somebody has to accept the charges. There's some kind of a term. Collect call, please. I'm a student in Bible call. I don't have any money. And I don't, it normally takes multiple calls. My sister answered the phone like that. And I just, I, I didn't know how to do this. I I'm, have to be diplomatic. Uh, how, how are you, Judy? I didn't, what am I supposed to say, you know? I've been burdened. And she says, oh my gosh, Jerry, I can't believe what happened. I said, what do you mean? She says, I, I almost died. I said, what do you mean? Her husband, that she married when she was very young, had been to Vietnam for years. He came back and it really, he was just, bless his heart, the guy was really messed up. He was on drugs and alcohol and anger out of control. He was so angry with her he had a really fast car. He was driving the car recklessly, threatening to crash it on purpose, pulled out a revolver, put it right in her face, and said, you're dying now, and threatened to kill her. And she said, but some reason, I don't know why, he just stopped the car and said, get out. Call me, said, get out. I got out and walked away. I said, what time was that? And she told me, and I just broke out weeping. I said, I was interceding for you. I heard your voice in prayer, and I cried out to the God of heaven to have mercy on you, and you're alive today, Judy, because God cares about you. Do you see the partnership? Do you see? Are you hearing me? This is partnership. It's not complicated. You don't have to have a degree in theology. You don't have to be a perfect communicator. You just have to have a voice. You have to have a heart for God and a willingness to just try it. Wherever you are in your journey of prayer, I'm asking, would you consider coming up to a new level? We're just coming up. In fact, I, I just feel, I wrote this down, I feel like there's a restoring taking place in God's kingdom right now regarding prayer. I feel it in my own life, and I'm, 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 I'm listening, I'm hearing it from other leaders and other pastors. It's like God is restoring the, the respect for prayer. It's like, what happened to us? The busyness of life. Even for pastors, I, I've heard this recently, more than one place. The busyness of church and ministries and demands, suddenly the prayer candle didn't mean to. We, we can do this. We, we can do that. Yeah, we can do it. We got more time. We got more calendar. We got a little more money. Let's go, 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 go. And suddenly the time slot. See, the cost of prayer is great. But the results are extraordinary. <laughs> the results are extraordinary. And, and so I, I feel for my, I'm, I'm leading, I'm taking you on my journey right now. I literally feel God is restoring in me the place of prayer. Can I, can I just be candid? Let's just say what it is. It started on me about six months ago. I've always prayed. And, and I mean that in a... In a it, humble way, factual way, whatever. I, I've always been a person of prayer, I would say, but not like it was. And the busyness of life and anxieties and stresses. Two things, busyness and the, this sense of stress and anxiety is so overwhelming. I mean, is it easy to pray when you're stressed out? The opposite. You want to go veg out. Go just watch movies and eat popcorn. 
uh, uh, whatever. So, it, and it's shaping our spirit, soul, and body. It's forcing us into a mold that we didn't intend to go to. And, and, and I just feel God is, it, it, for me, the last six, eight months, it, I've been waking up anywhere from one to three o'clock in the morning. And most of those times, I never go back to sleep. Not every day, but it's three or four days a week. This morning, it was four. And I was real sleepy. And I thought, well, I'll go back to sleep. And I laid back down, and I couldn't. And I, thought, and I started getting attacked in my mind. Anybody ever get that? Attacked in my mind. You're a loser. You can't do it. Da, da, da. That whole rat-a-tat-tat, you know. And I started believing it because I was tired. And I said, wait a second. Guess what I'm going to preach on today? <laughs> so I just lifted my hands. For a long, long time, I didn't have Aaron and her to help me out. <laughs> I just lifted hands and started crying out to God, not for myself, but for the church. Got it off of me, because the devil hates that, see? Oh, right. Poor me, oh my. It's okay to have a poor me. I do that too, but you really want to put, put mud in his face? I pray people get saved. I pray San Diego has revival. I pray churches in the city for, oh man, you're going to mess with the kingdom of darkness when you get outside of your pain and start giving your prayer time away. That's a real prayer life. Now, we're supposed to pray for ourselves. We should. No, no, no condemnation. I pray for myself and my stuff every day. Every day. Lord, bless my stuff. Bless my wife. Bless my body. I, I, all that stuff. But then, then there's like this other level. God, I'm interceding, and I start naming people. My friend Sam, I love so much right here in the second one. I love this guy, like a brother to me. Pray for him and his, his profession and what God's doing. I, I'm thinking of people. I'm thinking of Mario. Is Mario here? Right there, Mario. I've been burdened for Mario lately. I've been praying for him personally. I'm, I, I'm just going through the church. I've been praying for different people, and I, I use the time to just kick the devil's teeth yes. in. And suddenly, what happens is there's momentum in me, joy confidence, that weirdness, that vibe is gone. So God is reminding us. He's restoring. He's restoring us, taking us back to the place of the effectiveness of prayer, reminding us that we are called by his name to pray. I read it to you. If my people who are called by name, da, 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 pray. Do the dot, dot, dot. If my people who I have given them my name, I've given them my name. They're called, by, they're my people. They're Christian after Christ. My people call. I've given them my name. I've given them my DNA. I've given them my authority. If they pray, significant things will happen. There's great significance to our prayer. But here's the thing. I've got to land this plane pretty quick here. Um, many of you sitting here are really good at prayer but you don't know it. <laughs> or, take it for, you don't believe it. It would be common for you to either think or say, oh, I, I can't do that. I was at a prayer meeting the other day, and there was a, someone praying really, I thought pretty good there, and afterwards said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't pray like you guys. I don't, I don't know how to do that. I said, well, just stop that, stop that. I just heard you pray. You're great. Don't go there. I can't. I don't know how. I don't understand it. It's too hard. I don't know what to say. I tried. It didn't work. And we get these thoughts based on feelings and emotions. These thoughts become a stronghold and they limit us from stepping into God's world of prayer because we evaluate ourselves. He never quantified your prayer based on how smart you were, how, how well you, how much you talk and how many Bible verses you know. He just said, do your best to get those things fixed. But the bottom line is, if my people pray, I will work miracles. If my people, not anybody, my people call by my name, if they will give themselves to this prayer. See the significance of our calling. We are called to pray. Call. People call. My people call if they pray. It's a calling. But anyway, all those negatives, uh, the conclusion of those negatives is, you know, I can't. It's too hard. I don't know how. It's wrong thinking. We develop a way of thinking in our mind, in our brain, that pro it naturally prohibits us from getting in a place where there's prayer because we don't think we've already should. Our body won't let us go. Because our mind's saying we can't. Mm. Wrong thinking will stop you from physically going to the place where you can get a miracle. It's a stronghold 
Can I tell you what it is? It's a stronghold in your mind. And I'll tell you how you got it there. See, the devil doesn't want you to pray. Because he knows everything we've been saying here. He knows that if God's people pray, he's in danger zone. When we pray, things happen. People get saved. People get filled with the Holy Spirit. People are water baptized. Amazing things happen when God's people pray. And the devil knows that he's known it historically. Whole cities have been shaped. Nations have been changed. Uh, uh, schools have been turned upside down because somebody prayed the price. People came together. And so the devil knows that. So he wants us to live defeated, not to get into the very power that God has given us. Just listen to me. The devil cannot, everybody hear me, this is really important. The devil cannot defeat you with power. Hmm. Now he does have power. He's an angelic being, God, angels and demons do have power. But Jesus fixed that on the cross, yes, meaning that the devil can come right to your door, beaming with power, but he can't come in unless you open the door. He can come in with his power. Theologically, he has stopped at the door of your marriage, your life, your body, your finances, because his power was cut off on the cross. But he gets in when we believe his lies. His only tactic is not his power to tell you a lie. You can't pray. You won't get healed. Don't ask God for finances. It works for other people, but not for you. You're just not smart enough. You're not spiritual. You made too many mistakes. Wrong thinking becomes a stronghold that the devil uses to shut us out of the miracle. We've got to change how we think got to change our thinking. I need to, let me just read this to you. Romans chapter two is a famous verse. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't let the world shape how you live as a Christian. That's what it say. Don't let the world ideology, just stay busy and life will get better. Just get some more money and life will get better. Totally denying the whole God component. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world. Copy the behavior and the customs of God's kingdom. Yeah. Then he says, let God Transform you, and a better word that we is change you. Let God change you into a new person by changing the way you think. Let God change you into a new person. How does he do that? By changing the way you think, by teaching you what he thinks. It's not what we think that matters. It's what he thinks that matters. And when we adapt to his thinking, we change. Now, I want to take that phrase, and I want to, can you bring up the phrase? I'm going to take that now. No, not that. Not that, the one, let God change you. We got to see this. It's in, I'll just say it to you. I'm going to take the phrase from Romans 12, okay? And it says, let God change you into a new person of prayer. Let God change you into a new person of prayer that sees results. Let God, somebody here say that's me. Let God change you into a person that prays and sees results. How is he going to do it? By changing the way you think about prayer. We need to change our thinking. We need to get our minds washed clean today. I want us to say this, and then we're going to close. I want us to say these words. God is changing me. Can you put that? You had it up there the last time. You're doing a good job. Come on for the tech team. You guys are amazing. God is changing me. God is changing me. How about that paragraph? God is changing me. You got it? There you go. Say this out loud with me. Ready? God is changing me into a person of prayer by changing the way I think about prayer. My prayers are significant. My prayers work. My prayers are effective. My prayers bring results. My prayers are in partnership with God's power. That's who you are. He's changing you. I want all the men to say, I'm a man of prayer. God, God's, the Bible says specifically that the men, male, the men should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Men, hold your hands up. Father, I pray that men in this church would be holy. They would avoid every touch of uncleanness and immorality. 
I pray you cleanse their heart and cleanse their minds. I pray that the men, young and old alike, will become mighty in prayer, mighty men of God who know how to lift up their hands and get a hold of heaven and bring result to their wife, bring results to their children, bring results to their grandchildren, bring results to their finances, bring results to their needs. Men of God who know how to pray in Jesus' name. Ladies, put up your hands. Say, I'm a woman of prayer. Lead them in a prayer, Tammy, and how, what the women can pray. M women who pray like you pray. This guy, this lady right here is a tiger in the tank for prayer, I'm telling you. Father, I thank you that um, if, you, if you need prayer, just lay your hand on your chest. If you need prayer for anything, you're asking God to do something in your life. Maybe you need prayer for healing. Can you, if you can, can you put your hand on that place you need healing mm -hmm. and close your eyes and just say to yourself, I believe Jesus will heal me. I believe Jesus will take care of my difficulty. And after this prayer, I will be healed. After this prayer, God will answer me and change my circumstances. After this prayer, we're talking about what you're going to do after this prayer. I will speak boldly to my body. You are healed. It doesn't matter what my body's saying. It doesn't matter the pain. It doesn't matter what I feel, but it matters what God says. And God says I'm healed. So I confess over my body after this prayer, I am healed. I confess over my circumstances that after this prayer, you are answered. I say I'm healed because God says I'm healed. I say I'm delivered from difficulty because God says I'm delivered. Oh, I don't have to wait till the delivery comes. I already know I ordered it from heaven, from Amazon. It's on its way. It's paid for. I'm just waiting for the delivery. I say I have it. I have healing. I have deliverance from difficulty. This is my confession. From now on, I'll confess it's on its way after this prayer. Prayer. After this prayer, I will say what God says. Thank By his stripes, I'm healed. After this prayer, you, I'll, I'll see thank myself you, healed. I'll see myself delivered. Thank so you, right Jesus. now, I'm going to pray for you. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. You died for us. Your flesh was torn for us. His body and his was shed for us. His blood was shed for your healing. He purchased you. Oh, out of difficulty, out of sickness, out of sin. He He's now your shepherd. He's here now saying, I'm your shepherd. He's here now to touch you. So Jesus, I pray, dear Jesus, reach out your hand. Lay your hands on these dear people, on our dear friends. Pour out your healing virtue. Pour out healing to everyone. Give deliverance to everyone. Sickness, I bind you. Sickness, I rebuke you. I command you to leave. You must disappear. You satanic force, I rebuke you, you demon spirits, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I command you to go from their body immediately. Go now, leave now, depart and never return. Sickness, go, 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 go in the name of Jesus. Go, go. You must bow to the name of Jesus. Every difficulty in my life must bow to the name of Jesus. You must obey the name of Jesus Christ, who has all power and authority in heaven and in earth and under the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now declare victory. I now declare healing. I now declare I'm the winner. I now declare success. I now declare my package. My answer is on the way. I am healed. My problems are answered. I declare a power surge through your body from the top of your head down to the soles of your feet. I declare the anointing breaks every yoke. I I declare the love of God floods yes, your body, soul, yes, and spirit. I declare the peace of God and the joy of the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Heavenly Father, cast away all the thoughts.
thorns and the difficulties and the thistles. Oh, that your people can live their lives in prosperity. I command failure to leave you. I command worthlessness to leave you. I command low self-esteem to leave you now. Self-hatred, condemnation, guilt, and shame. Abusive spirits must go. Oppression, depression, lies, obsession, possession. Leave now. We say the curses must go. The poverty must leave. Mm -hmm. And let the abundance of God come. Let on these come. children of Let Abraham. Come, the blessing the of Jesus come. come. Favor come. Abundance come. Blessing in come. The Holy Spirit will pour name. out his spirit on in you. And you will have an abundance of joy in now. Jesus Great victory and success in is yours now. In Father, I thank you for answering these Jesus prayers. I know you're always answering our prayers. I know we can't see you in the flesh, but you're here in the spirit. Mm -hmm. We feel your presence yeah. in us and around us and surrounding us. Mm -hmm. And Father, you, we Jesus. know you're carrying out mm -hmm. every plan. You're hearing us right oh, now. Oh, you're right healing now. everybody is right healed. Now. I am right healed now. in the name of Jesus. Jesus. I'll go out confessing I'm healed and I'm prosperous in the name of Jesus. Yes.